I just started writing an introduction about kind of like why I'm writing this book, what my origin story is, why I think origin stories are important. I interviewed an expert on origin stories just to kind of get her perspective. And then there was this decision of like, should I use an indie publisher or should I try to go to a, a major publishing house? Today, we have returning guest and my friend John Small on the podcast, and he's telling us all about the process of writing and publishing his debut right about now. Look, I think all of it is about just first and foremost, it's all about taking a risk and jumping into the unknown. The other thing I always found is that they all, most of them had a lot of kind of doubts and fears going into it, right? Like they suffered through the same things that I think a lot of us think, which is like either you have imposter syndrome or you're the fear of failing, which is a huge thing for writers. It's just the, the idea that you're going to put something out there and it's going to suck. I've been writing for 20 years. And I still have that fear. Yeah. I fear this book that I'm going to put out is going to suck, right? And everybody's going to hate it and be like, why the fuck would you write about origin stories? Like the most boring, you know, whatever. I have all these fears, right? But you got to do it. In this episode, John shares what he's learned about writing through the origin stories of his favorite authors. We also explore the exciting world of indie publishing and brainstorm some book launch ideas. This episode is full of DIY inspiration, so let's get into it. There's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Welcome to The Bleeders, a podcast and support group about book writing and publishing. I'm writer and podcaster Courtney Kosak, and each week I'll bring you new conversations with authors, agents, and publishers about how to write and sell books. Hi, my name is John Small, and I am the producer and host of the Write About Now podcast. And now John is the author of Right About Now, the book. You are about to learn how he used his podcast as the basis for his new book. It's a really smart strategy. So here we go. I'm so excited to talk to you about your book. Yes. Thank you for talking to me. And you've believed in me from the beginning, Courtney. Oh, I do. I think this is a really great idea. So today we are going to talk about the origin story of your origin story book. When did you first get the idea? I mean, you've wanted to write a book forever, right? So I've wanted to write a book about right about now forever. And I want to write a book kind of collecting the various things that I've learned from this podcast that I've made for the last five or six years, where I interview all these really well-known writers about, you know, what they learned and what their stories are and what they write about and why they're so inspired. And one of the things that, that I kept coming to was always, you know, there's so much to, there's so much to, um, to take from the podcast. But one of the sort of common threads I found over the years is that a lot of times writers would share how they got started. I would ask them like, how did you get your start? Uh-huh. And I always found that part like really interesting because yeah. I think as a writer, it's such a solitary kind of lonely thing. You're doing it by yourself for most of your career. Right. And it's nice to know that there's other people out there who are successful, that they kind of went through a lot of the same struggles that you did, that they had the same doubts and insecurities that you had. And there was something sort of comforting in hearing these origin stories. Plus, they were just interesting stories because storytellers tell good stories. I mean, that's kind of what they do for a living. So when I was trying to think of like a common thread, it was like a very laborious task where I would go through all the transcripts of all the different interviews that I'd done over the years. And there's over over 300, right? So, and you know, I'd be like, oh, themes. And the one of the common things that was always there was the origin stories. And I had gotten some feedback from listeners over the years, like, I love the origin stories. I love hearing a good story. I love hearing how people got started. And I thought, okay, that's going to be the first book. There'll there'll probably be many write about now books, but that's one that I can get my head around. But then I was like, what the hell are origin stories? Like, you know, you always hear that word used a lot. And then I kind of did a little bit more of a deep dive into like why origin stories. So what are they? Um, Origin stories are how we, (laughs) they can really be many things and they can mean different things. And there's different origin stories for different things, right? In this particular case, we're talking about origin stories of people's writing careers. So it's how you got started. It's your journey from kind of like the unknown 
through to usually I stop the story right when they started becoming kind of successful, right? Yeah. I kind of like, we'll wait for the second. But it's really that journey that if you want to kind of go to like a Joseph Campbell, almost hero's journey type of model, it's like getting past, it's starting in the ordinary world and getting past the threshold and then entering the special world of writing and kind of how you got there and what you had to overcome to get there. And so that kind of really appeals to me. And I think that's what appeals to people in general about origin stories, because I mean, if you think about it, like some of the best movies are origin stories, right? Like, you know, Star Wars and, uh-huh. and some of the best books are origin stories. I mean, even I, I even say in the book, like if you think about it, like the Bible, like the origin story of Jesus is like very yeah. interesting, right? So it's like from the very beginning of time, like people have been interested in how people got started. I think it's super inspirational. Yeah, I'm obsessed as well. I think it's awesome that you did a book about it and you you have had just like an amazing array of guests, David Gran. I guess we kind of want to go in order, right? So you got the idea for the book. When exactly this specific book? When did you figure out, okay, it's origin stories? I think it was like about a year and a half ago. And I was actually, was, I'm going to give credit to my wife, Diana, because she was the one. I was like, I'm just, I'm kind of torn. Like there's so many different things I could write about. I could write about like storytelling. I could write. And she's like, what about the origin stories? Like that's the part that I like the most. Like I love uh-huh. hearing about people. And I was like, you're right. Like that. So that clicked for me. So once that clicked for me, I started collecting all the origin stories of, that people have told me over the years. And it's kind of frustrating because, you know, had I known in, in hindsight that this was going to be right. a book I was going to write, I would have asked everybody their origin story. So there's some people who I've interviewed over the years that I did not ask them that story. And, and I could have called them back maybe and asked them, but I kind of wanted to keep to, to the what was actually on the podcast. That, so there was the collecting of the origin stories. Then there was the I wanted to clear all the stories with people to make sure it was uh-huh. okay if I included their stories in my book. So that was an arduous process because some of these people I haven't talked to in five years, some of them are very famous, you know, and are hard to get in touch with. But I was able to do that. So wait, how many people did you decide to use? And then, yeah, tell us about that going out to them process. And how many did you lose along the way? <laughs> yeah, I lost some people. And I will admit there are some people that never actually signed off on this. Um, and we'll just have to see if they're going to sue me or not. I hope not because they're I basically not. took everything they said verbatim. I, I didn't change anything. No, I mean, the process was in the end, we ended up, I think with, I think we have 31 stories now. There might be 32. I, I have a, the book is coming out soon, but I have a few more days to like make my Tweet. edits. And there's yeah. one, there's one writer that I really want to include in the book. And I've asked her for a long time if I could use her story she's just always busy and on tour and her publicist, you know, I don't have her direct line. So it's always like dealing with her publicist. And so I'm hoping she'll be in it, but that will make it 30. Just do it. Just, just do, do it. it. It's like the, <laughs> the greatest story. I wish I, I don't want to out her, but she's so interesting and her story is really interesting. And I think would mean a lot to people. But anyway, I feel like you're kind of protected because you already have their story on tape. It's like, it's already public. Yeah. I think it's a, it's, you know, I've talked to some lawyers about it. It's a bit of a gray area. Well, yeah. maybe it's not even that great. I mean, listen, when we do pocket, I don't get people signing release forms. No, I, I think that's no. pretty awkward where it's like basically like I'm allowed to use this this conversation in perpetuity for in any way I want. You know, basically the agreement, the sort of unspoken agreement is that I'm using this for my podcast and for nothing else. So, you know, I guess they have some legal case that they did not know that this was also going to be in a book. But, you know, again, I'm not changing anything. I'm changing it for I edit stuff for you know, grammar and stuff like that. And, yeah, yeah, making sense, making sure that they don't sound like idiots because it's it's a spoken word book. So like, you know, the way people talk is not always the way you read things. So you have to sort of fix it. But yeah, there's like only a few people that I wasn't able to check with. I hope they don't come after me if you're listening. <laughs> Betsy Johnson. We're so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if you're listening, Betsy Johnson, I tried to get in touch with you. are a very hard person to track down. Oh shit. That's a really good one. You have to include yeah. that. I know. Even though she lived in it, she lives in it, used to live in a pink trailer in Malibu. I could have probably gone up to her because how, how could you miss it? And just knocked on her door and said, Hey, can I use your story? Look, most people were thrilled to be in the book. Some people pushed back because they were embarrassed about their stories. They just thought they were embarrassing. And one person wanted to be paid, but that was it. Like for the most part, everybody said yes. Good. Okay. So then you got your sign offs. What was next? Then I started editing it. It took a long time to edit them. I found a book that Terry Gross had written called, I think it was called Because I Asked. 
And it was kind of a similar idea where it was, she just basically took moments from her fresh air, you know. Ooh, that's uh, a good comp. comp. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good comp. It wasn't the newest book in the world, but it was cool. It had like interviews with Nicolas Cage. And I kind of copied a little bit or just borrowed a little bit from the way she did it, where it was kind of like a little bit of a dialogue format, which I like. Uh -huh. So I kind of curated it in that way, edited them down. Then I wanted to write kind of after reading all these, like why origin stories, like what it meant, why I was writing this book. And then of course I realized I have to share my own origin story, which I had never really thought about too much. Like I'd never thought about my own origin story if for writing. I mean, I've kind of talked about it a little bit on different podcasts, but it was kind of cool to like, you know, after hearing all these amazing people's stories to kind of say, hey, I have my own story too. And I think that's kind of what I hope people take away from the book is that like, either you already have one, which is fun to mine, or you're kind of starting your career and you kind of want to, you get excited to hear about how other people did it. And everybody does it in a different way. And the thing about origin stories is they're yours, you know, in this world of like AI and like nothing being like original and people being really scared of, of AI. It's kind of nice to know that nobody can ever like fabricate or copy your origin story. Like it, it, it's yours, right? Uh -huh. um, and, I, and I like that about it. So once I came up with mine, I just started writing an introduction about kind of like why I'm writing this book, what my origin story is, why I think origin stories are important. I interviewed an expert on origin stories just to kind of get her perspective. Smart. And then there was this decision of like, should I try to self-publish the, well, I don't like that word. Should I use an indie publisher or should I yes. try to go to a, a major publishing house? And I went, I did, I do have an agent and I asked her what she thought. And she said, you know, for a book like this, it's probably better if you just do as an indie publisher. It's kind of like might be hard to sell this book in the, in the market right now. And I was like, okay, that was good, honest advice. I just figured I had to ask her. And honestly, I was a little bit relieved that she said that because I just wanted to get the book out there. And I knew that if I had to go through the process of writing a book proposal and then waiting for people to give me, you know, I had just gone through this process a few years ago. I pitched a book with her about anxiety that I didn't sell, but it was a very long process. It took like over a year just to get the pitch out there. And, and then we didn't sell it. And it was like, wow, okay, what was that all for? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't want to do that. Like I already have the book written. It's ready to go. Like, let's just get it out into the world and see what people think. And hopefully it helps people. And hopefully it, it kind of gets more attention to the podcast and to, yeah, just like gets people excited about being creative. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that part. Cause I feel like people don't really understand the advantages of indie publishing. And it's like, you can put whatever you want in your book. So Alex Alberto is this writer who has a micro press and they wrote a book called Entwined. And in yeah. their foreword, Alex put their email address, encouraging readers to get in touch. And it's like, you can't do that in a traditional book. I know. I just talked to my editor about, can I include links to like each of the interviews. I'm, I'm finding out today. Oh, about that. that's a great idea. Because what happens is you're reading these little excerpts and then you want to be like, you listen know, hey, I'd like story. to listen to the I'd like to listen to the whole thing. And so it's just a nice way to help. A, they don't have to go and Google it. So I'm taking a step away from them. And B, it's just nice to get the traffic from, you know, other sources. It's nice yeah. to get because you're always trying to get more listeners to your podcast. And so I'm hoping that they go for that. If that's an interesting you know, I have no idea how that works with like, okay, what do you do with the print version? Like that does not going to have links and whatever. But no, I think, listen, I will be the first to admit that I was very, very snobbish about indie publishing. And I think it's just because I came up in a traditional publishing world. You know, you I have friends. felt like it public. wasn't like legit yeah. or whatever. It just felt like not legit. It's like, that's what people do who can't really write and like who it's kind of like anybody can self-publish kind of idea. But I don't think that's true anymore. It isn't true anymore. The, the industry has completely changed that doesn't have the stigma that it used to have. And uh -huh. I do think that economically it makes more sense. Like you, you make more money. I think from a creative control part, it makes a whole a lot more sense. And I think at this point, getting published by a traditional publisher, while it's is really more of like an ego thing, yeah. there's two things I think that are good about <laughs> it. One is that you can say, oh yeah, Random House is my publisher, right? So yeah. there's like a sort of like status thing that goes with that. The other thing is that they have these incredible distribution channels, right? So you, you know, your book will be at like Barnes and Noble and 
you know, where your parents might see it. I mean, nobody really goes to, unfortunately, really goes and shops at bookstores anymore. But, you know, so I think there's a little bit of that kind of like idea that it's on the shelves. And with indie publishing, I don't think it works like that. I don't think my book can be on the shelves necessarily sort of like as an order on demand kind of thing. So listen, I still have, there's like a still little part of me from like the old days. It's like, oh, I kind of wish this was like, coming from a traditional publisher, because then, you know, everybody always asks, well, who's publishing it? You know, it's like one of the, at least my friends always ask that because they're like, you know, snobs. I have to say, after talking to Alex, especially, it's very cool to own your own rights and be able to do whatever the fuck you want to do with them. It seems like a more strategic business decision. Like there's a lot of reasons why you would want to indie publish. Yeah. Anytime you can take out the sort of third party, you know, and yeah. just make it you a direct relationship between you and your audience, I think it's just a better move. I guess another hope might be that the book becomes so, so successful as an indie book that maybe eventually a publisher wants to distribute it. This is what happened to Andy Weir, Weir who's oh, yeah. online, right? So he was one of the guys I talked to. So Andy Weir wrote The Martian, among other really good science fiction books. But The Martian is his most sort of famous one. He wrote it as a blog, right? That book, The Martian, which then Matt Damon made into a movie. He released it as a blog. It was like free, basically, to his fans. Eventually, they're like, you know what? It's really hard to read this like, as a, as a website, can you make this on an ebook? So then he like figured out how to do that. He put it on as an ebook. And this is a guy, by the way, who was not a writer. He was a software engineer. He just happened to be writing a book, or he just liked to write sci-fi, like on his on the side. So he eventually made it an ebook. And then they're like, you know what? This is still really hard to do. I don't know how to do. Ebook. <laughs> you do a Kindle version, and then he did Kindle. And the Kindle, you know, they require you to charge something. So he did the minimum. I think ninety nine cents. And it just totally caught on, you know, just word of mouth and him promoting it on his blog, et cetera, which just became a huge hit. And then it caught the attention of a publisher and then he got a big publishing deal and then he got a that movie deal. Awesome. So it's kind of like a great story of somebody who like never thought about making any money off of this. It just wanted to share a really good story and was like more excited about the reader feedback than the actual like commerce of it all. But it kind of felt it all fell together for him. And now he's not a software engineer anymore. And he's a pretty accomplished, famous writer. So I love that as an origin story. I love yeah. the origin stories where people kind of are almost like accidental bestsellers. Like, you know, like Kristen Hanna, who wrote The Women, which is like a, the number one book right now. And she also wrote The Nightingale. And she's like just amazing writer. I mean, she was a lawyer. She was like a, a frustrated lawyer. Her mother got sick. And so they basically made this deal that to kind of like bond, they would write a book together, oh. um, which was really sweet. She wanted to write a horror book. Her mom wanted to write historical fiction. So they wrote a historical fiction book. And then her mom died before they finished it. And she kind of put it away, went back to law. And then when she was pregnant, she kind of you know was looking for things to do. She was bedridden. And she started rewriting the book that she started with her mother. And it was just giving her so much pleasure that she, you know, that she finished it. It was so much more fun than anything she'd ever done in her law practice. And then she gave it to an agent and the agent said, this is a really good story, but you have to learn how to write a novel. <laughs> so, she's like, you have no idea what you're doing. So she went and, and I thought this was really interesting. She just basically like picked up a bunch of best-selling books or books that had been bestsellers. Like I think she said like The Prince of Tides is one, The Witching Hour. Uh -huh. And then she just read and became like a student of the bestseller and then oh, started taking I a lot of that. notes and like figured out the formula basically, and then rewrote the book to kind of fit the formula. And she made a deal with herself. If she didn't make it in six years, she would just give up on writing and just go like go back to law and just, you know, and she did it. She sold her book when her kid was two years old. So her first book when her kid was two years old, and now she's like, you know, one of the best selling authors like alive. Fucking crushing it. She's completely crushing it. Obviously she has a gift, but it was interesting that she kind of accidentally became a writer. Incredible. So tell yeah. us about, yeah, the common tropes that you found putting this together. I mean, I think all of it is about just first and foremost, it's all about taking a risk and jumping into the unknown. Like Kristen Hanna just said, like, I'm going to just do this and try this out. Every single writer that you meet that has been a professional had to at some time make a decision to do this crazy thing, which is write words down on a page and expect people to pay you to do it. Right? <laughs> Truly like it's psychotic. an insane idea. <laughs> That like, because everybody can write, like everybody can write words, <laughs> at least most of us can. Many people who are literate can write, but the idea that you're going to get paid to do it 
is a little bit of a gamble. Like, is anybody ever going to want to read or pay money for your work? And so everybody kind of starts with that kind of, you know, some people are much more confident than others, but they all kind of take this leap into the unknown. I think that's kind of one common thing I found. The other thing I always found is that they all, most of them had a lot of kind of doubts and fears going into it, right? Like they suffered through the same things that I think a lot of us think, which is either you have imposter syndrome or you're the fear of failing, which is a huge thing for writers. It's just the, the idea that you're going to put something out there and it's going to suck. I've been writing for 20 years. I still have that fear. Yeah. I fear this book that I'm going to put out is going to suck, right? And everybody's going to hate it and be like, why the fuck would you write about origin stories? Like the most boring, you know, whatever. I have all these fears, right? But you got to do it, right? Because if you uh -huh. don't do it, then it, nothing's going to happen. Like it's all the fears are in your head. So there's a fear of failure, the fear of rejection. So I felt like that was a, a big thing. They also kind of all faced a lot of failure. Like Kristen Hanna, like I said, like an agent said to her, you know, this is not a novel. I mean, but there was at least something in what he said to her that made her think, well, I can, I can do this. A lot of people might just be like, at that point, be like, well, I'm not a novelist. Like, yeah. I, obviously, like I'm a lawyer. This is silly. What was I even thinking? But she didn't. So there's a kind of there's a kind of common thread in the art, the successful writing origin stories where they like faced failure, but they actually didn't let it detract them. If anything, they let it inspire them or they just decide I'm going to keep doing this anyway. You know, I think those are some really good ones. I think a lot of them found like mentors or like people that believed in them along the way that really encouraged them to continue. I think that's very important. I think like finding a cheerleader or a few cheerleaders that can kind of like be your mentors is invaluable. I mean, I found that early in my career. I had, there was a woman at one of the magazines I worked at, Child Magazine, who was like my early mentor. And she basically, you know, first of all, she just loved everything I wrote, which was nice, you know, because yeah. I was young, very insecure. But then she also at one point said to me, you know, I, I got this thing back one day and it didn't have a lot of her notes on it. And I was like, she could see that I was like, why does this have all her glowing notes about how amazing I am and stuff? And she's like, <laughs> John, you're going to find out that when you get really successful, people stop telling you how great you are. They just expect it. Like it becomes expected. And that's like the mark that you've actually like arrived, right? It's like no longer do you need all the encouragement. Of course, I love encouragement. No, everybody <laughs> loves it. I can tell you, please. But I think if people stop telling you like how great your stuff is, that kind of is a sign. That's true. And I thought that was really cool. And so over the years, I've had definitely had some people that have been there for, in my corner just telling me that you know, my dad was very much a big proponent of my writing, my mom too. Like he was always like, you're so damn good. I mean, if anything, my dad was annoying because he'd be like, why are you not writing for the New Yorker? Like he's like, oh, it was never good enough. <laughs> I think. But, and my dad was a very successful composer and musician. So I like that to me that my father like sort of acknowledged that, you know, I had something meant a lot to me. So yeah, I think having mentors. Yeah, I think those are some really, really those are kind great. of strong themes that kind of carried over for me. You got to like write that article for Lit Hub or whatever to promote your book. The things I've learned. Like the common tropes of origin stories. Origin stories. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Lit Hub. Okay. Not as a sub stack. You could write it as a sub stack too. You could also just write some things, try to place them. And like, if they don't go immediately, you can yeah. publish them on your sub stack just to get okay. like another audience. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. See, Courtney's so good. She's so good about how you <laughs> this is where This is where you're going to talk to me about how to help me promote because you're such a great promoter. I will definitely throw in my ideas if I have any. But okay, so you're, you got it published through Legacy Media, which... Tell us about, a little bit about that. The Legacy Launchpad is a friend of mine. Anna David started it. We are friends for many years. We taught at Media Bistro together. It's really like, it's mainly a ghostwriting company. She helps like executives write their books and she's been quite successful. It's funny because she doesn't remember this, but I was at a wedding. I will never, I don't know why I've never forgotten this, but I was at a wedding with her. It was Taffy Brodesser Ackner's wedding to drop a few names here, who's also <laughs> successful writer, right? And we were talking and she, she was asking me what I was up to. And at the time I was actually doing a lot of ghostwriting. So I said, oh, I've, I've been doing ghostwriting. And she's like, oh my God, I could never do that. I could never 
Oh right? my God. Other you can never fighting. say never. You're I know. She's like, future. I would never do that. That would, that would like, cause at the time she was, she had just published a fix. She had just published her own novel. Like party and, girl. Party yeah. girl. Right. And I just remembered, you know, I don't think I said like, oh, you're crazy. I just was like, okay. And then probably felt really insecure that I was ghostwriting. Like, thanks Anna. And then, then you know, look at 20 years later, she's like basically made a really good living being a, a professional ghostwriter. I, she doesn't actually do the ghostwriting. I think most of it herself, but she has a lot of team of people who do it for her. So it's been a very good business for her. But she did this as me for me. I'm completely not her type of client. And so if you're looking- It was I, like a favor kind of, right? It was a, a bit of a favor. Yeah, it was a bit of a trade where I helped her out a little bit. And I think that's okay to sometimes trade. Although we learned that it's better to do some sort of financial exchange because- when you barter, I'm not a big fan of bartering. It's really nebulous. It's too nebulous. It's hard to put a value on, you know, what I was helping her do is helping her promote some stuff. She was helping me. I'm not, I was going to do a sub stack about how like I'm not that big into bartering. And we've, luckily she's a good enough friend that we've had this conversation a few times. We're like, like we kind of set parameters on what we can do for each other to uh -huh. help each other out. But, but there had to be a little bit of money exchange because, and I have spent, it's not like I haven't spent any money on this. First of all, you have to get, a book professionally uh, copy edited. Like I, yes. even though I'm, you know, use Grammarly and am a professional editor. First of all, you shouldn't edit yourself at, at a certain degree. You have to have somebody else come in. So I, I did have it professionally copy edited, which was very helpful, you know, and then her team helped with like the cover, even though actually I ended up using a friend of mine did the cover. I just wasn't loving the covers that we were coming up with. So uh -huh. I asked a friend who works at Scholastic who I've known for a long time, who does usually does children's book covers to do my cover. And she just did it gratis, which was super nice. Thank you, Marika. That Marika. is so nice. Shit. I know. And I was like, I'll pay you any. And she's like, no, 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 no. You don't have to pay me. This is cool for me. I don't usually do adult books. So I really like the cover she did. It's very simple, but it's like really cool and looks cool. Yeah. So, but Anna was incredibly helpful and has been, she's a great person to work with. And if you're, you know, I don't know if she really works usually with people like me. She tends to work more with like big CEOs. But if you happen to be a big CEO listening to this and want to get a book out there, I super recommend Legacy Launchpad. Totally. So now you are heading into the promotion phase. You're, it's about to drop. My Achilles heel. Yes. Is it? Okay. So let's talk about your game plan. Okay. So first of all, there is you know, writing articles about the topic in some way that's compelling that I can sell at other places. And it's so funny because, you know, I've written articles my whole life, but when I have to write articles about something that I'm trying to sell, it suddenly becomes like very tricky for me. I don't know why, just because like I get a block, uh -huh. of like nothing's interesting, nothing's good. But I, that's why I like to talk to people like you about like, well, what would be some cool ideas that could come out of, you know, writing this book. So that that's one thing is I do want to write articles for other people about things that I've learned from writing this book. The other thing that I want to do is get on a bunch of podcasts like yours yeah. where I'm just talking about it and you know, hopefully helping people, not just selling my book, but also helping other people think about their origin stories or at least thinking about, you know, getting people inspired to write books based on, you know, the fact that other people have done it before you and did just fine. Cause I think we all have that, you know, People probably listening to this podcast love books, love the idea of writing a book, but maybe are a little bit hesitant to start. And so hopefully this is a little bit of a spark that will get you going. So it's, yeah, getting on other people's podcasts, having them come on mine, doing sort of a, you know, I have a podcast. I think it's important to look at what you have, right? So what do I have to offer? I have a podcast that has a good listenership and, you know, do some stuff on my sub stack, um, uh -huh. which is another thing I have. I, I, by the way, if for those listening, it's called Small Talk, which is probably confusing. But anyway, my sub stack is John Small no, Talk. Cute. Yeah. And then there is trying to go out and do some speaking engagements. Ooh. And that is that is the the really ultimate goal of this is that I would love to, you know, I you and I both love teaching. Well, I'm assuming you love teaching. You do a lot of it. <laughs> I do love teaching. Um, yeah, I love teaching. And so I love the idea of, you know, using this book as a way to kind of do like a TED talk, but, or really just do classes, um, yeah. whether they're on campus or with adults. Like I'm totally down to teach what I've learned, not just about origin stories, but just in general about writing and about storytelling. So I'm hoping this is kind of like a, uh, conduit to like taking the next step in my career of doing that. Cause I, it's something I love to do, but it's just, and I have done it. I taught at NYU. i did a class recently for Pandemic University. I have a class coming up through Writer's Workshop, but I want to be doing it more regularly and 
to bigger audiences, et cetera. So that's awesome. I think those are my plans. Do they sound good to you? Yeah, they sound good. So uh, one more thing I think you need to do is I think you need to do a free workshop. It doesn't have to be your like full on bells and whistles that people pay for, but do like an hour or 90 minutes of a talk on whatever related to your book, like how to indie publish a book. And you're going to offer that for free. How people get in is they order your book and they send you the receipt. So they are buying the book and they're getting into your fold. I I see that a lot these days. In fact, I just bought someone's book and sent them the receipt to take their workshop. (laughs) So I think you should do that. Awesome. Yeah. And you can promote it on your podcast. I think one of the things I I don't struggle with, but that I think about is like, what do people want to learn about? Like I, right now I'm teaching a a class called the secret formula of writing stories that sell. And that is kind of like a little bit of a continuation of what I used to teach at Media Bistro and what I taught at NYU, which is like, I think that there is kind of a method to the madness of getting published in a magazine or on a website. And I love teaching that, but I feel like there's more, like I I almost want to get more. I want to narrow in, I guess, The world will tell me whether learning more about origin stories specifically is interesting. I don't Uh know if there's anything there in terms of like, like a practical thing that people want to know. I think you could do your TED talk on that and you could like start on like the TEDx stage or whatever. But what you were telling me about these common tropes and then when you illustrate them with an example of like this person who's crushing it. If what's interesting is how much they do kind of parallel the hero's journey. Like there's a reason that that formula works is because yeah. I think it's very real to life. I mean, and again, maybe I'm imposing, projecting a bit on them too, but for those who are unfamiliar with the hero's journey, like it's, you know, it's basically every superhero movie you've ever seen where it's kind of like, there's a person that starts in sort of the ordinary world and then is called to action by some thing that makes them have to do it. And then, and in this case, it's often, you know, the, the need to want to write or the need to like get published. And then it's like taking that, leap into the unknown and then facing the obstacles. So I find that interesting that it kind of parallels that our lives actually parallel the hero's journey. And even if they don't, honestly, it's kind of fun to frame your life that way because I think it gives your life some meaning. <laughs> because, yeah, give, your, give yourself a freaking story arc. Come on. Give yourself an arc. Like why? <laughs> you know, life seems so random. And I think sometimes it's really nice to put together the pieces you know, life is not really linear, unfortunately, even though it seems to be chronological. So it's interesting to kind of look back and put together the pieces in a way that's really a story. And you're not really making it up, but you just have to think about it a little bit differently. I love it. Okay. So are you going to see how this goes or do you already have another one in the works? About a book? Yeah. I'm going to see how this goes. I mean, I definitely, I had, when I was doing a lot of research on the podcast about the content, I had little buckets of like, themes and would sort of like take content from the podcast and say like, okay, it goes under this theme. And so I'm seeing if there's another theme. I'm also, I'll let my audience kind of tell me a little bit about where they're at and what they're interested in hearing about. I'm also, you know, interested in just doing my own take on something. This is obviously kind of more of a curation of things Uh that I've learned over the years through other great writers. I would love to offer my own perspective as a full book. And I think that I have been reluctant to do that in my career, feeling that I don't have enough to share, you know, like to fill a whole book. But I actually think I do. I just haven't gone onto the threshold and leaped into the unknown, right? I think that, so it never stops. Like you're always doing these journeys. It doesn't like once you do one journey, then you got to go back and start another one. So I have been thinking about that. I definitely, I have a bucket list thing of wanting to write a novel um, and so I'm excited about that. And, but I don't like to talk about it too much because I feel like it's just boring to hear people talk about how they're going to write a novel. Like, just do it. Like, I hate when other people tell me like, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to write, write, write my novel. Like, good luck. Good luck. But I do have some great ideas and I just really, again, need to do it. But, um, you know, I'm writing all day for my job job. So it's always finding time to write, but I do love it. I know that's so relatable. You have to love it. Oh, that's another thing about origin stories. They definitely all have a passion for what they're doing, right? Yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so sick and twisted to keep... (laughs) In fact, I'm writing that down on my list of things. Well, I have to say, I'm so excited for you. I think this is so awesome. 
I'm thrilled to watch it come out in the world. I'm going to be the first person to order it when I get a link. Can I give you a shout out? Sure. You are been have been so encouraging and you're just such a good listener and you know, offer so much advice and counsel. I'm just so glad I found you. You know, we met so randomly at a, and again, this is something that you initiated a writer's meetup. Like, no, you didn't have to do that. Nobody had to pay to go to this writer's meetup. You just like decided I'm going to, I just wanted to meet writers and I did. I met you and Melissa and we've been hanging out with our friend Stacy. That was such a great idea. Like I would never think to do that. And I, I really admire that you, you're willing to put yourself out there and you will admit that like, you're not always the most social person, right? Didn't haven't you said that to me? Oh yeah, no. <laughs> and yet you do these, you kind of make yourself do these things that are very social and you're very good at being social. But it's like really impressive that you kind of put yourself in that situation. And it's not only helping you, you but you're obviously helping a lot of other people kind of connect. And wait, I'm aren't I supposed to interview you now? That's so sweet. I only have no. six minutes. I'm worried. No, we're good. I okay, everyone needs to buy. John's book right about now. You're going to be smart about this and have the links everywhere, right? And we're going to have it in the description. There will be in the description of this podcast. If I have not given you a way to find this book, then I'm doing a terrible job at promoting my own book. So we'll make sure you can find right about now the book. You can also listen to the right about now podcast. As John mentioned, he's got some great workshops coming up. We might even collab on a workshop. Oh I am teaching something called the Midsummer Pitch Party, which is a grand experiment of a writing intensive every day in July that you can sign up for at CourtneyKosak.com slash teaching. It's Courtney. My last name is K-O-C-A-K.com slash teaching. And yeah, I'm going to have you back after. We'll continue this conversation after you've learned the lessons of promotion. I also think just one final thing. I think that you pitching yourself on other podcasts is brilliant. It's going to help you sell the book and grow the podcast. And I think you should have a coaching or teaching option available on your website when you do that round of promo. That's a really good idea. Because people are going to want to work with you and they should have the option. Well, I would love to work with people individually. I think that's a great idea. God, you're so good. That's a great idea. So stay tuned for more about that for sure. So it's been about four weeks since John's book launch. And before I published this episode, I just wanted to reach out to him and check in for a quick update about how it's been going. And this is what he said. It hit number one on Amazon, which was big. I also got a ton of positive reviews and one sort of bad review, which actually made me think the book was legit. I published an article about the importance of origin stories in entrepreneur.com, have been getting a lot of attention from business community, and just my own personal observation, I've also noticed he's done some podcast interviews as well. And he did a whole campaign around getting early reviews for his book, which I think helped him hit number one. Anyway, definitely buy John's book. I got my copy in the mail and it is delightful to hold it in my hands and read it. It's so exciting. So congratulations to John. I've got a link for the book in the episode description so you can get your copy too. And by the way, Midsummer Pitch Party was such a success that I am bringing it back as back to school pitch party in September. For my first cohort in July, my students wrote between 27,000 to 40,000 words, and they have landed bylines in places like the Huffington Post. It was amazing, and it's going to be amazing again in September, and you can join in the fun. So all the info is on my website. Check it out at CourtneyKosak.com slash teaching. Again, Courtney Kosak is K-O-C-A-K dot com slash teaching and use code bleeders for a hundred dollars off and i also have some one day workshops coming up again all of the info is on my website it is courtneycosec.com slash teaching and you can use code bleeders for a hundred dollars off back to school pitch party and that is it for this edition of the bleeders if you missed the last episode with chloe caldwell make sure to go back and check it out It's a little taste of our upcoming submission series. And here is a little preview of that conversation. So this day was like 
a horrible day. I had meetings from let's say like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. I met with Harper Collins and Penguin Random House and Emily Bessler books and like back to back to back. So it started with like meeting an editor for a green juice and her telling you why she couldn't do the book and then meeting someone for a coffee and them telling you why they couldn't do the book. Oh my and God. And meeting someone for lunch. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Bleeders. Oh, writing is so much better with friends. I'm your host, Courtney Kosak. And hey, let's connect on social media. I am at Courtney Kosak on Twitter and Instagram. My last name is K-O-C-A-K. And make sure you're signed up for the Bleeders Companion Substack. There is a link for that in the episode description. Join me again next week for an all new episode. In the meantime, happy bleeding. <laughs> <laughs>